Hello, this is Strategy Miss Lanny here with episode three of uh, the Children of a Dead Earth campaign. And we are beginning here with another Delta V puzzle. Uh, basically, we have a ship that is currently stranded at the L4 Lagrange point between the Sun and Mercury, and we need to go resupply them. So, basically, our, our fleet at Ceres was destroyed by the USTA, and the flagship was able to escape and somehow has ended up in, at the Sol Mercury Lagrange point, uh, number four, point L4. And we have a methane tanker. We have to go basically resupply them with some food and make sure that our leadership from the series campaign doesn't starve to death. So let's get started here. So now the grounds points are an interesting concept. Essentially, um, any sort of Sol or any sort of body orbiting another is going to have five Lagrange points around it. So, for example, here we have uh, L1, basically right uh, between the Mercury and the Sun's gravity, much closer to Mercury because it's much smaller. Here we have L2, uh, which is basically dragged around outside of Mercury uh, by the gravity's balancing. And then we have L3. This is the classic sort of sci-fi. Oh, imagine if there was another Earth and it was right behind the sun, so we never saw it. This is the exact 180 degree point from Mercury in the orbit. And then we have L4 here, 60 degrees ahead of Mercury. And we have L5, 60 degrees behind Mercury. Now these two are really the most useful because uh, L1, 2, and 3, they're not stable. Basically, you have to constantly keep a ship doing station-keeping maneuvers if you want to keep it here. Whereas 4 and 5, you can actually have a ship orbit them like our gunship is. And so you could build a big space station there. Uh, there ends up being some collections of asteroids will sort of gather at those points. There are a few at the Earth's on Lagrange points. There are quite a lot at the Jupiter-Sun-Lagrange points. Those are the Trojan asteroids that you may have heard of. So, we've got our ship. We need to move inwards. So, let's see what we can do here. We don't really have time to wait until we get around to this part of the orbit, so let's just basically pull ourselves the other way. Spend, you know, a bit over a kilometer at delta V. Get into a narrower orbit a little bit. And let's give it a little bit of time to get out of the Mercury sphere of influence. We don't technically have spheres of influence because this doesn't use patched conics. It uses a full end body simulation. We are getting affected by the sun's gravity, Mercury's gravity, and to a lesser extent, the gravity of the other planets. So let's set our frame of reference to Sol. And basically, we need to catch up to this guy. So let's do a little bit of delta V work and see what we can do. So basically, we need to come inwards. And here, we're getting a point where we could, in theory, join them. But it's too expensive. It just costs too much delta V. We got to get a better, we got to get a better uh, point of point of rendezvous than that one. Basically, when you click on these ones in the options, instead of sort of doing the work yourself by fiddling with the controls, it's like you're kind of having an ensign on the ship do it, and they just aren't as good as you are. So you kind of have to fiddle with it more to get a proper result. So for example, let's say, let's say we're like this. Ship is still ahead of us, as you can see. We go in a little closer. 
Ah, here we go. So now we're getting that rendezvous point right up next to us. It only costs 6.84 kilometers per second. Let's see what happens. Okay, still costs too much in that case, but we can fiddle with this a bit more and hopefully get something more coherent. So let's start by doing this one and then burning for a couple of days. And then let's see what we can do about getting a connection here. What I'm going to do is set the frame of reference to the L4 point and see if I can't get myself closer into orbiting the L4 point by fiddling with this. So basically this is our frame of reference now relative to that Lagrange point. So we're gonna go here and see if we can't get ourselves into an orbit around it that works a little better. Maybe if we speed up a little bit. Oh, that looks that looks promising. That looks promising, no doubt. So let's start here. Go ahead and move ahead six days at a time. This rendezvous is not going to work, unfortunately, but what if we get here and we actually get ourselves to orbit this darn thing, maybe? Okay, let's go back to the Sol frame of reference, see if we can understand this a little better. So this is us. And yeah, the ship's still getting ahead of us. What if we kind of pull ourselves in a little bit more? What if we do something like this? Okay, again, too much delta V. This one can be a bit frustrating, I will admit. So let's try setting the frame of reference to the gunship itself and see if we can get a little closer here. Sometimes this can be a real, real help. All right, so we're going to come in a little closer here. I might skip through some of this. Okay, what if we kind of bring it in like this and we also pull it back a little bit.
And again, just not enough delta V. Let's see. Again, over the time limit. But we're getting there. This, this number is getting very small. All right, let's get rid of that one. Let's go forward a little bit again. And let's see if we can't get this to look a little better here. All right, we got 2.1 kilometers per second. See if we can't figure this out. Maybe, just maybe. We can actually get this to work. If not, we'll have to restart and kind of hope for a better trajectory, essentially. All right, see if we can't get this to work. We are so close. And yet, still have a lot to do. So close. If we had one more click of delta V and a little bit more time, we could do it, but we don't. All right, we're out of time. Our high command has starved to death at the Lagrange point. Let's try that again. All right, so I had another failure. I just went ahead and I'm going to clear that out. I am basically just fiddling with maneuver nodes for a long time. It's not that interesting to watch. But what I have found is that if you're able to just get a good, a good intercept without fiddling with all the frames of reference, that seems to be the easiest way to get this, to get this done. If possible to do so. Here it is not, as you can see, but let me Start by running this here, then we'll fiddle with this a bit more.
Oh, that's a good one. Look at that. All right, that'll work. It's not the fastest or the most efficient, but it's good enough. Basically, I just had to find one that had a close lineup between these where they're basically going the same direction. Let me look at what it looks like from the other spheres of influence here. So here's what it looks like relative to the Lagrange point. You can see we're sort of merging with them as they go around the top of it there. And here's what it looks like relative to the gunship. We're basically just burning and burning until we reach them. Almost orbiting around them in a way. And there we go. Not fast enough or cheap enough to get anything besides bronze. I'll have to fiddle with this at some point and see if there's a trick to it that I'm missing. But for now, that's basically the best way to beat it reliably, in my opinion, is not to try and fiddle with those fancy spheres of influence or frames of reference, but to basically just stick with the orbit around Sol and try and get everything to line up. So, on to the next mission here. There is a space mutiny. So the first officer of one of our warships around this little uh, asteroid named Interamnia uh, has mutinied. And uh, normally we might just blow up the ship now that these perfidious mutineers have turned traitor against our glorious navy. But uh, the captain of the ship is the daughter of an important senator on the Martian parliament. And so we would like to rescue her if possible uh, and presumably rescue any loyalist members of the crew also. So basically we either need to destroy their uh, power plant or, or essentially all the radiators. And we also need to get the ship to be have its engines destroyed so it is dead in space. And we need to do this without actually destroying um, without actually destroying the crew module so that the crew itself is alive, we can capture the ship and rescue the captain. So we have a gunship much more powerful than their laser skiff. Really the issue here is going to be uh, a surgical takedown, essentially, trying to take down this ship without just destroying it. So we can see we're both orbiting Interamnia here. I'm in a wider orbit than them. And let's see what we've got here if I do sort of a inwards push. Actually, you know, asteroids, they're pretty, the orbital velocities we're talking about here are pretty slow. You can see if we do an intercept here, it's only about 70 meters per second. So let's do this here. Let's go inwards towards the asteroid, very close. Come back around, intercept them here. It'll be great. Yeah, we only have to use 120 delta V, and we can fiddle with that intercept a bit more once we're getting close. So there's one day. There's another six hours. And here we go. I'm going to, here we go. Commander tries to claim that we're being lied to by the high command. That may even be true, but, well, the transmission is jammed. And let's see what we need to target on them here. So let's target those big radiators. That should basically make their reactor not work anymore once we take out the big radiators. Um, let's take out their engine, and let's, uh, well, aim at all their weapons here. And now I don't want to use anything too heavy. I'm going to disable the heavy coil, coil gun, and I'm going to disable, well, the laser turret should be fine. Um, the sniper coil gun sounds like a good idea. 
The flak missiles are pretty unpredictable, so I won't fire any of those. And the scatter railgun. Again, probably unpredictable. Let's turn that off. And let's start by just homing in towards them so that we can get a little closer. They are firing decoys. We are firing our sniper coil gun. Then these blue tracers. And well, let's see what happens with those shots first before we do anything else. A lot of them are missing, unfortunately. But we are getting some impact there. Shot off a radiator, that's very good. Damage some of their fuel tanks too. And let's see, what if we orient broadside? I think now we can maybe get some of our lasers to start working. Let's uh, ignore the range on those and get some some of these crazy powerful 100 megawatt lasers blasting away at them. Those are, you know, they're not going to burn through the whole armor of the ship, so they're really good at taking out weapon mounts. So that's a great thing to start with, really. Yeah, see, we just took out one of their laser turret mounts. Beautiful. And we kind of just need to keep this up. Keep plinking away with our laser here. You can see it sort of surgically destroying their weapons. And if we can just get this other radiator, then we should be in a pretty good, there we go. Gorgeous. And there we go, they've been disarmed. I really kind of think we should have won at this point. I mean, looks like they don't have any... Well, they have some weapons still, I suppose. That may be the problem. There we go. All those radiators gone. That's perfect. Basically, we're just trying to take out this last uh, blast launcher here, looks like. There we go. The first officer has surrendered. We'll go in and rescue our glorious captain and take the rest away to probably some kind of space gulag. I'm not really sure. Hopefully, hopefully we'll treat them better than that, but we shall see. And so you can see how the lasers were pretty helpful for the surgical takedown because if we'd been firing, you know, our our heavy our heavy coil guns here, some of those shots might have blasted through and accidentally destroyed the crew module, um, something like that. And so that's what you've got to be careful about here. If you're needing to do these surgical takedowns, which there's another mission like this that'll come up later, then this is really a pretty good way to do it. So, that was much quicker than the last one. In this case, we didn't really get anything that would have related to a higher rating, but here we are. And now, we have a battle over Mars, uh, which is kind of our uh, central headquarters planet for the Republic of the Free People. So what have we got? We get a support carrier, uh, which has a bunch of drones, including some beamer beam drones, which is nice. Those have laser guns on them. They're pretty good at shooting down other drones in particular. And we've got a skirmisher, which it looks like has some nuclear missiles and a cannon. And is a pretty small ship, only weighs about a ton. As opposed to our support carrier, which weighs... Uh, 5,000 tons. I should have said the skirmisher weighs about a kiloton. It weighs about 1,000 tons. Now what are we facing here? We're facing a laser frigate. Now a laser frigate has some very powerful lasers. Uh, well, it really just has one very powerful 100 megawatt laser, but it can fire out of eight different turrets, so it can kind of fire at you from any direction is the idea. Then it's got a bunch of railguns, big ship, 
expensive ship. Those laser turrets will make it difficult for our drones to get in close or for our missiles to get in close. So we'll have to be a little clever here. All right, so we can look at the enemy fleet here. There's not really stealth in space in this game, and probably not stealth in space in real life, at least in the context of technology we understand within one solar system. There's probably not so much stealth in space. Uh, the reasons behind this are a bit complicated, but the main one is basically whenever you fire your engines here, that creates a huge plume that everybody's going to see. And even if you're not firing your engines, number one, they kind of know where you're going because you're just coasting. So they can project from when they last saw you fire your engines. And But you could say, oh, but we'll use you know cold gas thrusters to change the course slightly. Over the long run, we'll get in a different place. Problem is all these radiators radiating heat. That's also pretty obvious. And you could say, well, we'll hide behind a planet. But the problem is once you have little cameras and satellites and things all over the solar system as opposed to looking from one point, well, that doesn't work so well anymore. So, uh, we are in close to Mars. They are far out. There is Deimos and Phobos. Um, yeah, let's look at Phobos real quick. Probably not going to go here, but it's a nice little space potato. So... And we are actually orbiting the opposite direction from them. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by going outwards, both to the plane change and to actually reverse our orbit. Uh, basically, by going out here where you're moving slow, you can do both those things more efficiently. So let's get going. And up and up. And here is the uh, orbital node, I think. Let me find that. So basically, what we need to do is reverse ourselves. And also tilt ourselves a bit. So we hop around going the other way. Now let's lower our apoapsis a little bit. All right, I want to wait a little bit until we're behind them again. Now this looks like a great time to launch some drones and missiles. We're going to do sort of a combination flight this time. So let's see, we have 10 beam drones. Let's launch five of those. We have 25 stinger drones. Let's launch... 15 of those. And then on our skirmisher, we have 100 nuclear missiles. Let's launch 40 of those. And then let's send this sort of unified fleet of drones and missiles to go blow these guys up. Basically, we'll hope the missiles will fly a little bit ahead. They'll cover the laser fire. And hopefully some of them will even get through. And even if they don't, they should at least provide some distraction so that the drones can get through and do some serious damage to the enemy vessels. So, here we go. They are way ahead of us, as you can see, so we're going to need to kind of burn the orbit out a little bit. Oh, actually, this might work pretty well. Let's do a flyby, see what it says here. Okay, that'll work quite well. 
So in 15 hours, we'll have an intercept getting as close as 12 kilometers, unless we mess with this a little bit more, which we might. And here we go. Ah, this this fellow wants to be uh, wants to be sporting about this. Ah, may the best commander win. Well, we shall see. So, group all units by five seems to work well. We're going to target their laser mounts. We're going to target their big radiators. We're going to target their rail guns. Basically, we shoot off these. They won't be able to generate electricity to power their laser anymore. And to some extent, their rail guns, all of those take less electric power than their laser. And we're going to start by having a few of our nuclear missiles hold. And now we're going to send them through in waves. You can see they're shooting those up already. And let's look at some of our drones here. So their lasers have very short range. I'm going to let them run at longer range pretty soon. The Stinger drones, I'm going to go ahead and let them open up with the cannon. They're not technically in range yet, but this flyby is not going to last that long. And so we got to get a chance to do some stuff before it's too late. So let them fire off their cannons here. Hopefully they can get some done. And we can look over at the laser frigate. You can see it firing its lasers at our ships here, our drones. And here we are. You can see our cannon fire starting to come in. And doing great, doing a great job right there. All right, how are our nuclear missiles doing? I want to warn you before the flash goes off. But so far, they're pretty far away still. Now our beam drones, let them ignore range too. Do a little firing with those too. And unfortunately, every everything of ours has basically run out of Delta V or been destroyed. But we've taken out uh, a couple of their rail guns, one of their methane tanks that's less important, one of their radiators, So we did do some decent damage to them. We chipped off another part of a radiator. Oh, and our drones are able to fire some more at a distance, it looks like, or at least having some last parting shots come through. Uh, unfortunately, those didn't do so well. But that's a good uh, first strike on the target. And we do still have more ships and more missiles left, so we'll uh, give that another shot in a little bit here. I'm going to try and align our orbits a little better, too, I think. We're still not really on the same plane. So first off, let's extend our trajectory a little bit, make ourselves a little wider here. And then where is the um, orbital node here? I think this is it. Okay, let's get our orbits on exactly the same plane. That should make things easier for the future. So there we go. It's been an hour or so. Now we're just slightly behind the enemy ships. This looks like a good time to launch another wave. So let's send out our remaining beam drones. Let's send out our remaining stinger drones. And let's send out another 40 missiles. If these don't take them out, we'll have to actually close and try and use our cannons and rail guns to take them out directly. Which is not ideal. We'd like to keep our enemy ships on our, our ships unscathed, of course. But if necessary, we should be able to do it. So let's go fast, try and catch up to them. Let's burn inwards so that we actually are angled correctly to do so. And let's see what this looks like. 
Okay. Have to angle it a little bit more. All right, let's see. What if we angle it a little bit less, but also come around this way? See, I want to save the missiles some delta V so that they can actually do their jobs correctly, you know? Um, so let's see what we can do about that. Let's say we burn inward so we let this guy, so we can catch up to this guy. We'll try that instead. Yeah, so that nice uh, close burn in. And then we'll do an intercept here if possible. That's a lot of, that's a lot of Delta V. I think I can do better. So we come around inwards. Yeah, that's a beautiful meeting point there. We just have to fiddle with this a little bit to make it a proper intercept. So let's see. Really, a lot of this game is fiddling with maneuver nodes. If you're not okay with that, then this may not be the game for you. Although another large part of this game that I haven't showed yet, uh, because we haven't gotten to the missions where you're allowed to do it yet, is the ship and module design. And if you don't want to have to beat all these kind of Delta V puzzles and combat missions before you get to that, there is an option in the game that'll let you basically just skip right to that. If that's what you consider the good part, you can skip right to it instead of having to fiddle with all of this beforehand. The, um, the designer is nice enough to give that as an option if you just want to mess around with building, building stuff as opposed to having to deal with all, all of the missions. So that is an option for you. I'll get to a ship design probably in the next two or three episodes. We'll spend quite a bit of time on looking at ship design because there is a ton of stuff you can do with it. Um, a lot of goofy stuff and then some stuff that actually works. And if you go check out the forums, there are uh, some very wild designs out there too. Uh, laser frigates that laser ships that can shoot, you know, a accurate laser a thousand miles away and just uh, destroy everything before it even has a chance to get to it, unless you can build a really good counter. Um, gigantic swarms of drones and things. Now, some of those will just freeze up your computer because the drones are. Uh, putting a lot of units on the board at once can cause problems for the game, uh, depending on how good your computer is. I at least have definitely had problems with it before when I've tried to put huge numbers of things on the screen at once. I'm going ahead and turning off the range for these guys. We'll go ahead and let the missiles strive, fly straight in. They'll hopefully get there ahead of the drones. Well, it looks like the drones might be actually accelerating past the missiles right now. The problem is the missiles don't have that much delta V, so they're kind of saving it for the final burn inwards. But you can see our blast of cannon fire going. We've got some lasers hitting the enemy, although at this range, they're just not that strong. Definitely not as strong as what they've got. But yeah, here you can see what I'm talking about, about the the game freezing up a little bit. It does this. I mean, it's a design by one eccentric designer, one eccentric genius, I would say, designer. And so you kind of have to expect it to be not as polished as the latest AAA release, but I'm perfectly willing to deal with that. All right. Now, in this case, uh, we got a lucky shot off. I think we must have taken out the taking out the crew module or something. Um, I'm not sure. No, there's the crew module. They're okay. Uh, but they definitely lost something important. Probably their reactors or something. And yeah, you can see where the shots all just kind of blasted in and took out the armor in this middle section. So, great success on that mission. Um, our ships were alive and unscathed. We spent very little Delta V. However, we weren't quite fast enough, so we only get the silver.
All right, so now we are out around Uranus. Uh, in this case, we have a cargo run here with a freighter from Miranda to Titania, or Titania. Uh, basically, in the Uranus system, instead of being named after mythological figures, the moons are all named after Shakespeare characters. Uh, I'm not sure why they decided that exactly, but that was the decision for the, the moons of Uranus in particular. And basically, uh, Miranda apparently has a lot of fissile materials on it. Um, it's got uranium, it's got plutonium, it's got that sort of thing. This might be because Miranda had a major impact at some point in its past that really scrambled the place. So there's probably chunks of what used to be the core of the moon on the outside, and heavy stuff tends to fall in towards the core. So I'm guessing that's the theory behind this. So, basically, we've got a cargo freighter, and we've got to make a cargo run, basically, from Miranda to Titania. And let's see what we can do about this. Another Delta V puzzle. Now, with this whole system with a bunch of moons, I'm guessing there's probably some fancy tricks you can do. But I think what I'm going to do is basically we're going to leave Miranda here. And let's see how fast are we orbiting them. Ah, oh, pretty fast. So we're going to start the trajectory here. And we're going to burn outwards, get away from Miranda here. Let me see if I can... Yeah, you can see how the surface of Miranda is really chopped up. It's it's quite a bizarre landscape. At least from what we could tell from pictures from the Voyager spacecraft, for example. I don't think there's ever been a lander sent to Miranda yet at this time. Maybe someday. So, let's go out and let's switch our... Oh, interesting. Yeah, we'd be going close to uh, uh, Puck here. Yeah, you can see a lot of them are from kind of the the Shakespeare plays that involve fairies and supernatural creatures. You've got Mab and Puck and a lot of others here. Let's see. Well, Ophelia, that's more from Hamlet, of course. Juliet, yeah, Romeo and Juliet. I guess they're not all from sort of mythological Shakespeare plays or Shakespeare plays involving fairies, but some of the major ones definitely seem to be. Anyway, getting back to around Uranus here, what I think I want to do is get in close to Uranus and use what's called the Oberth effect to burn outwards more efficiently. So what we're going to do is get in real close here. Oh, maybe not that close. Like 0.75 delta V, getting closer than the closest moon. Because when we're moving so fast in a planet's gravity here, this actually makes our uh, fuel more effective at changing our orbit. I'm not exactly sure how to explain the science behind the Oberth effect. It, it feels like magic when I try and understand it myself. But it's real, and being in this close lets us use less delta V to get out to the orbit of the moon here. So let's see. In this case, we're not even close to getting there. So I'm going to try this a little bit differently, I think. We're going to actually pull inwards on this side for another kilometer or so. If this doesn't work, we're going to have to restart, unfortunately, but uh, we'll see. And now what I want to do 
is waiting until about maybe 90 degrees or so behind the moon. And I think that's when we'll want to launch ahead. So when I'm about maybe here, there's an actual formula for this, but when the when your orbit is so small compared to their orbit, you can kind of eyeball it by that you want to be about 100 degrees behind them. I, I know I said 90 initially, but you want to be more like 100. Um, at the maximum diff distance between your orbit and theirs, the phase angle should be something like 113, I think. So in this case, I'm eyeballing it as about 100. And the nice thing is we can kind of fiddle with it too. So let's see what this looks like. We are here, they are here. Oh, that looks nice. That looks like a good maneuver. Let's get in a little bit closer here. And now uh, what we want to do is eventually be captured by the moon there. Okay, let's move this maybe a little bit backwards. And okay, no, I meant the other way. Let's move this a little bit the other way. Get lower in their orbit there. That looks good. And just a tiny bit more outwards. Oh, let's see what happens here. Let's say that I click on join the station. No, not quite enough delta V to do it, just the lazy way. So we'll have to fiddle with this a bit more. But we do this first burn. After we get around the loop there, come out towards it. And now is when a frame of reference change can be real useful. So we'll go to the frame of reference of Titania here. What we want to do is make sure we're going around the moon in the same direction the cargo station is. And we want to make sure we can get captured by the darn thing. So let's go ahead and advance 10 minutes and see which way this thing's orbiting. Or maybe more like an hour. That'll be easier to see. Okay, so we do want to go on the side of the planet that we're on. That's good. That means that we've set this up correctly. And so now, once we're kind of over here, let's see if we can't get captured by Titania here. So that would collide us with Titania. Not quite right. And you can see where we're getting more and more captured by their, their force. All right, well, that's pretty good for a start. Let's uh, start by screaming it around like this. Uh, that might be a little close to the planet than I want, although, again, Oberth effect. Kind of useful to be that close. So, there we go. We'll have to do another burn after that one. So, six hours, six hours. Now we're getting close. So what I want to do is set up another burn right here at periapsis, or that's technically orbital node, but that works too, really. It's really close to the moon. And let's burn a little bit. You can see we start getting these sort of wacky orbits. But this should work. That's only 142 meters per second to join up with them or 148, so not even that different from their estimate. And in 12 hours, we'll be there. So let's go up and around, up and out, let them catch up a little bit. And now we start the merger process. And boom, we are there. I uh, need to do it about eight hours faster or need to save a lot more delta V if we want to actually uh, get better than bronze on this. May have to try that another time. There may be some sort of really clever trick involving a gravity assist around one of Uranus's moons to do this that I just haven't figured out yet. Um, we may come back and fiddle around with this sometime, but for the basics, uh, coming in close to Uranus worked pretty well. You could also just do a direct transfer out from Miranda, and that might actually work pretty well, too. But let's take a look here. All right, so the next one's going to be the big one, what, the first big one. We'll, we'll do this next time. Basically, we're sending a fleet to retake Ceres. 
um, series was captured by the USTA a couple episodes ago, or a couple missions ago. Series, of course, largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. I believe was considered a planet at one point briefly. It's a little bit like the thing with Pluto, where by the definitions of the day, Ceres was considered a planet, and then that was redefined. So we get a support carrier with our drones. We get a missile schooner, a whole bunch of flak and striker nuclear missiles. They get an escort carrier, so they got drones. They have a laser frigate. We've seen those before. And they have some orbital defense craft, which you can see they don't have much Delta V because they're kind of just meant to stay in one place. They use chemical rockets. And they have some flak missiles and a bunch of cannons. These ships are not a huge threat, but, I mean, the, they can still pose a problem. So, basically, we're going to need to beat them with more missile and drone barrages. Uh, personally, I prefer, if I have the choice, to just uh, build a ship that's got a lot of good uh, railguns and cannons and lasers and close with the enemy and have a good old-fashioned sort of space dreadnought to space dreadnought battle. But for this mission, we're not allowed to do that yet. However, when this mission is completed, ship design is unlocked. So at that point... Uh, you can start designing your own ships and also selecting your own fleets for missions. You can either build your own fleets out of stock ships or you can start even designing your own ships. And then a little bit after this, uh, so there's a couple other uh, missions here. There's another Delta V puzzle and there's this one where you have to uh, disable an enemy vessel uh, in order to capture someone on it. And then... You have Vesta Overkill. This is another tough fleet battle over Vesta. And once you've beat this, you can also do module design, which means not only can you design your own ships, you can start designing your own, your own rail guns, your own fuel tanks, your own engines, your own nuclear reactors, your own uh, warheads for missiles, all sorts of things. You can really just completely design from scratch, which can... Once you get to know it, it can be extremely overpowered. Um, until you know what you're doing, it can be very difficult. I'll, I'll go through some of that. I'll have, I think, I'll have the main series where I kind of beat the campaign, and then I'll have these side episodes where I say, here's some wacky ships I've designed. Here's a showcase of some of the goofier things you can do with ship design. Um, here's sort of a walkthrough of me designing one ship to show what it looks like. And here's sort of my basic thoughts on the philosophy of ship design in this game. So next time we will have the Battle at series, and we will see what we can do. So thank you all for watching. I am signing off for now, and we'll see you next time.